Mohammad Javad Zarif is here. He has been Foreign Minister of Iran since 2013. From 2002 to 2007, Zarif served as his country's ambassador to the United Nations. The foreign minister is in New York this week for the UN's Nonproliferation Summit. He met with Secretary of State John Kerry yesterday to discuss the ongoing nuclear negotiations. Secretary Kerry stressed the importance of the deal, saying that the hard work is far from over, but if we can get there, the entire world will be safer. I am pleased to welcome Minister Zarif back to this table. This is his 11th appearance at this table, most of them coming when he was ambassador to the United Nations. But I am pleased to have you back. Good to be back, Charlie. Uh, much has happened to you, and, and I look forward to having a full conversation, not only about the nuclear, but also about Iran's place in the world and, and ideas having to do with other countries as well. But you met with Secretary Kerry. Give us a status report. Well, we have made significant progress. Certainly, people two years uh, ago could not have imagined that we could come this far. Uh, it is when you decide to go for dialogue rather than uh, pressure and intimidation. Uh, that didn't work. I mean, it was in place for quite some time. Uh, sanctions, all sorts of sanctions were imposed on Iran, uh, and I believe they didn't achieve that objective, and that is why people opted for negotiations and for serious discussion. We've made, we've made significant progress. What we achieved in November of 2013, uh, in terms of an interim agreement, uh, was something that people, uh, the so-called naysayers, always believed would never be possible, and then after we agreed to it, a lot of people believed that, we, that Iran would never implement it, but we did and uh, the International Atomic Energy Agency and even President Obama and everybody else has said that Iran has uh, complied fully with whatever we agreed to comply with uh, for the past one and a half years. So we're now almost ready to go for a long-term agreement uh, that will ensure uh, that Iran's program will always remain peaceful. Uh, from our perspective, that's not much because we never had any other intentions. Uh, and at the same time, it will provide the possibility for Iran to engage with the West um, in a more normal fashion. Uh, I'm not saying the international community, because yesterday I spoke to the, to the NPT conference on behalf of a significant portion. The Non-Proliferation <laughs> Treaty Conference. The, the, the Non-Proliferation Treaty Conference. Uh, I spoke, I was the first person to speak in that conference as a representative of 120 member states of this international and, community. And Iran is a signatory. Uh, Iran is a signatory and a chairman of the non-aligned movement, which uh, brings together 120 uh, countries. So, uh, and all of them have views very similar to Iran. Uh, about nuclear non-proliferation. We believe that we, we should rid the world of nuclear arms. We, we believe that nobody should own nuclear weapons. Certainly non-proliferation is an important step to reach that objective. We, we certainly do not want even more people owning uh, these very dangerous weapons. So what happens if these negotiations fail? Uh, well, it won't be a disaster, but it would be a very important missed opportunity because it's a unique opportunity. The people of Iran went to the polls uh, a year and a half ago and chose a president who was calling for uh, engagement based on mutual respect. Now we have this opportunity that has been given both to us in the Iranian government as well as to the international community by the people of Iran to engage. And if our people see that engagement will not produce the necessary reciprocal respect that we expect, then uh, this would be, in, in my view, uh, an extremely important missed opportunity that will not only uh, prevent us from resolving this issue, which in our view is a non-issue because, as I told you, we didn't have any program to develop nuclear weapons. Anyway, we consider nuclear weapons both irrational as well as immoral. And why should the United States believe you or the P5 plus one countries believe you? Well, it, it, it is a problem of mutual mistrust, yes. uh, compounded mutual mistrust. And we don't expect anybody to believe the other side, as we do not, at this stage, have the possibility of simply uh, putting our confidence and trust in the words of the United States or other members of P5 plus one, certainly not the Western 
members of P5 plus one. There is a history of uh, problems, uh, grievances on the part of the Iranian people going back to mm -hmm. the time they overthrew our uh, democratically elected government all the way to, to the recent times. And uh, I, I assume that the United States and some of the Western countries have created reasons for themselves not to trust us. We don't, we don't believe that those are founded. So mm -hmm. what we need to do is to have a serious program, a serious program, a serious agreement that would enable every side to build this trust. But the important thing is that this process should build confidence, not destroy confidence. Unfortunately, what we see, the, the rhetoric that is coming out of Washington, particularly the debate that is going on in Washington, is not conducive to building you trust. You mean the assertion of the Congress that they have a role here? No, I, I mean, I don't interfere in the internal affairs of the United States. That's, that's for the American government to decide. And for us, as a foreign government, all foreign governments deal with the other foreign government as an entity. Not, we, we, we don't look into the domestic politics because that makes international life mm -hmm. impossible. If you wanted to decide how to deal with Congress, how to deal with the judiciary, how to deal with, uh, with the executive branch of every government, it would make it impossible. So we deal with the government of the United States, but we want to hear uh, statements and rhetoric from Washington that helps to build confidence rather than destroy confidence. Let's, this is not, yes, go Let's ahead. talk about confidence. And, uh, number one, uh, we all noticed that when you returned after the agreement, the, temp the framework agreement had been signed, uh, you were given a hero's welcome. You rode through cheering crowds in an open-air car. Uh, unusual for a secretary, a foreign minister, I would assume. What was that about? Was it there is on the part of the rank-and-file average Iranian citizen, somehow they want to rejoin the world and well, they the, want to stop this conflict with the United States and this calling of the United States the great Satan and all that. But the Iranian people uh, are rational people. They are people who resist pressure, resist intimidation. Uh, I think I said on this show some time ago that Iranians are allergic yes. to pressure. Whenever there is pressure, the Iranians react and react strongly. And you've seen what the pressure over the last eight years has brought uh, the international community, or at least the, the, the eight years where the pressure was the primary tactic of dealing with Iran. Maybe from 200 centrifuges yeah. when we last spoke here on this show to 20,000 centrifuges now. So what, what is important is that the Iranian people did not like that. They were prepared to go uh, and to resist that, but didn't like it. That was not our preference. Our preference was for dialogue. And because the Iranian people witnessed that their representatives were being dealt with uh, through a process of negotiations based on mutual respect, they were happy. But I can tell you that the same people will resist if they see that the agreement is not uh, respectful of their rights, respectful of their dignity, they will certainly uh, prefer to withstand pressure rather than accept okay. a, a, a bad agreement. There is a considerable belief in America that sanctions brought you to the negotiating table. That's the reason you're there. Well, uh, I, I think they're wrong. What brought us to the negotiating table is the belief that this government has, and this was the, the platform that was chosen by the Iranian people. There were six candidates. Some were much better than the current candidate in dealing with the economic problems. But they chose a candidate who believed in respect and engagement. That is why we are at the negotiating table. The proposals that we have, the, the possibilities and options that we present are exactly the same options that we presented to the international community eight years ago or ten years ago, and they failed to recognize the significance of those proposals at that time. And they then lived to regret that missed opportunity. Now they have another opportunity. They should understand that this is not because of sanctions. This is because of a choice that we have made to engage. If that doesn't, 
If that doesn't succeed, then we have other, uh, other avenues uh, open to we'll us. We'll talk about that, but let me just make sure I understand, because this agreement has nothing to say about the future conduct of Iran beyond the nuclear issue. It's not about Iranian support of any other group. It's not about Iran supporting this Hezbollah or anyone else. This is only about the nuclear issue. But do I hear you saying that you hope that if there's a nuclear issue settled and there's an agreement, uh, that you hope the U.S. and Iran can then build a relationship that will have to do with a wide range of issues and a respect for Iran and an awareness of Iran's history and its influence in the region? I'm not precluding that, but I'm not saying that this is uh, an eventuality that we can, uh, but do you want we can guarantee. We want to be able to engage with uh, the West based on mutual respect. We do not want to have animosity uh, with, with the West. Uh, we want to be able to enjoy the benefits of interaction. But we insist on our dignity. We insist on being able to engage yeah. based on mutual respect. That, that, that for us, is, is, is extremely important. But as soon as you say that, everyone believes, or many people believe, that the supreme leader you know, has is, had for a long time a negative opinion, to say it graciously, of the United States and believes that the United States and, and in fact has benefited from his rhetoric. At the same time, the U.S. president has reached out and sent letters to the supreme leader. Which he replied to. Which he replied to. Uh, the point is, the Iranian public is not just the supreme leader. The Iranian public, the general public, are very skeptical of U.S. intentions. This is unfortunate, but a reality. The reality is that the Iranian uh, general public in Iran uh, are very mindful of history, very much so. They remember the United States overthrowing a government, and, supporting a repressive regime. As you regime. know, the United States remembers the taking of American hostages. Yes. There they is, both have there a historical bad, memory. There is bad history. There is a public psyche in, in the two countries that have led to an atmosphere of mistrust. And we do not want to debate what happens first, who is responsible for this, but we, we should understand, we should realize this historical background and see whether through cooperation to resolve this issue, we can, in fact, dent that wall of mistrust that exists between Iran and the United States and see whether that provides us with an opportunity to move forward. So the Supreme Leader has been very clear that he doesn't trust the United States, like most Iranians. And, but does he want to see a better relationship with the United States? He, the he, question. he made it very clear in his latest statement that if this goes well, it may open the possibility for talks in other areas. This we need to decide. We need to see how this works out. We need to see whether the United States is prepared to deal with the Iranian people based on respect. Pressure. Do you have any doubt that the president of the United States doesn't respect the Iranian people? Well, uh, if, 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 you want, if you want to have an agreement and keep putting pressure and sanctions on the Iranian people, that doesn't signify to me a respectful approach. Now, if, if the president is prepared, it, it, it requires leadership. It requires a great deal of courage for Iran to accept, to take measures that we are negotiating. In, in, it, it requires a great deal okay, of leadership and courage. After 18 months, is it much better? Uh, is there more respect? Because you've spent 18 months in the trenches with Secretary Kerry. You have gone back to Tehran and spoken to the Supreme Leader. You, I assume you have briefed him on all of the details that you are involved. It is said by people who analyze these things that you especially have his ear. Uh, well, and you would not be where you are without his approval. Well, uh, it, it's, not, it's not the way that you portray it. Uh, the... Iranian system is based on the will of the people, and the people have chosen this government. Yeah. And the leader has always, throughout his tenure as the leader, he has always supported the choice of the Iranian people. So it's not uh, that so I have... So if Ahmadinejad, he supports it, him, and if Rouhani supports be, be, him. Because he's, he 
the leader respects okay. the choice of the people. Now, we have been talking. I have been reporting. Unfortunately, over the past 18 months, the United States can look at Iran and say, over the last 18 months, Iran complied with they, all the obligations. They have essentially said that. They, and they have said that. Uh, unfortunately, on our side, the United States has entangled itself in such a web of sanctions against Iran that even if it wanted to, it would have been difficult for it to, to get out of it. And sometimes we saw that some yeah. overzealous politicians had more insistence on keeping sanctions and on removing sanctions that they had agreed to remove. You will acknowledge that sanctions have done terrible damage to your economy. Of course they have. You can't sell your oil, you can't do one thing after yeah, another. But sanctions, you must remember, sanctions, if sanctions were designed, to hurt the Iranian people, if sanctions it's were to designed, change the mind of the Iranian government, not no, no, hurt no. the Iranian people. Yeah, well, well they, they didn't. The sanctions didn't change the mind of the Iranian government. The Iranian government actually went ahead with building more centrifuges. Mm. So what the sanctions did was to create an atmosphere among yeah. the Iranian population that the United States doesn't want to treat them well. That the United States is trying to put pressure on them. That the United States is trying to prevent them from even yeah. buying medicine okay. with their own money from, from abroad. You know that, uh, I mean, the United States is saying that Iran can purchase medicine. But if you go to a bank and you tell them that I want yeah. to send yeah. medicine to Iran, they say, I can't yeah. open an account for no you. No one doubts that these have been very successful sanctions. Now, this is not what I call success. It is. It's I mean, a success it, if, mean, if, in if, fact, if, if, you want, if, you, if, you, if you want to feel the pressure uh, of a series of governments around the world, <laughs> no, no, trying no. to influence the government to come to the table and talk about the nuclear issue because they don't want to see you, even though you say you don't want one, have a nuclear capability. No, you see, my friend. Yes. <laughs> the point is, if you wanted to antagonize the Iranian people, I mean, not you, if the United States government wanted to antagonize the Iranian people, if you wanted to, if the United States government wanted to create feelings and misgivings about the United States among the general Iranian population, then the sanctions have succeeded. But if the intention of these sanctions were to bring Iran to the negotiating table, that's not what they achieved. What they, How can what, you say that? No, because You're at the negotiating we table. We are at the negotiating table because people like us were at the negotiating table even before this election. My predecessors were negotiating. We were always at the negotiating table. We were at the negotiating table during the Khatami administration in Iran. President Rouhani and myself were negotiating. Then our successors continued to negotiate. It is now the United States which has abandoned right. that idea of zero enrichment. If the United States accepted that Iran had the right to enrich, 10 years ago, we wouldn't have had this, all of this nonsense yeah. for the last 10 years. So if so, you want so to insist... The U.S. now, the US now sees the, that as long as there are caps on Iranian enrichment, it's okay. The, I mean, that would have been possible 10 years ago, too. There were proposals on the table 10 years ago before a single United Nations yeah. sanctions was put yeah. in place that would have provided even a better option. But the United States decided to torpedo. The Bush administration, John Bolton, decided to torpedo the agreement that was being reached with the Europeans okay. at that time. And now they, they live to regret it. Let's and now they understand that sanctions do not produce results. Okay, let me talk about that sanctions. That negotiations produce results. I want to talk about several things, because a lot of Americans who you respect, I assume, whether it's Jim Baker or Henry Kissinger or George Shultz, you know, have raised real caution about the agreement they understand. And one question, and we'll talk about first, sanctions and other questions, inspection, and then there's some other issues. But let's just talk about sanctions in terms of this agreement. The United States has said that the sanctions should be phased out on the basis of good conduct and respect for the agreement. Supreme Leader and you, certainly the Supreme Leader said this publicly, we have to have the elimination of all sanctions at the time this agreement, final agreement, yeah. is signed. Yeah. All sanctions gone. Well, we are talking about economic and financial sanctions and the, the, what, what we agreed, the parameters of the agreement that we reached in, in Lausanne are very clear. That once we start implementing 
the first steps. Uh, and, and the first steps are very clear uh, about the number of centrifuges in Natanz, the number of centrifuges right, right. in Fordow, the, the stockpile, what will happen to uh, the redesign and rebuilding of a heavy water reactor in Iraq. Uh, the, these are all parameters of the sanctions, uh, of, of this agreement. All sanctions, all economic and financial sanctions must go. That is, all the UN sanctions, all the but EU the US sanctions. Says phased, and you say based on good conduct, and you say at the beginning. Well, it is, That's it what the Supreme Leader says it, it is now, very, it is before very, we sign the agreement. It is, no, not, not before we no, sign the agreement. At the time we sign the agreement. No, no, no. Sanctions must be lifted as soon as Iran implements its, agree, its agreed part. We have an agreement. That agreement provides for the lifting of all sanctions all economic and financial sanctions. Mm -hmm. And those sanctions are lifted. Because the logic is very clear. The logic is, if you want an agreement, you, you have two options. Option of pressure, option of agreement. You mm -hmm. cannot mix the two. Okay. It, it, it's, as if, it's as if Iran wants to keep uh, some parts. But will you grant me this, that what the Supreme Leader said and what Secretary Kerry has said about sanctions is different? A two different interpretations. Well, I, what I can say is what we have agreed upon. What we have agreed upon... Does it agree with what Secretary Kerry has said? Well, I, I allow Secretary Kerry to say what he wants to say and to define the agreement in, in the way he wants to define it. What I will say is what will be in the agreement if there is an agreement at the end of the day. If, the, if we have an agreement... That agreement must be based on this logic, very clear logic, okay, let that you cannot have two opposing tracks running at the same time. You either you mean have... The building up of sanctions, or, or what do you mean? What are the two opposing tracks? The, the two opposing tracks, one is to have an agreement, the other one is to, ha to impose pressure. Imposition of pressure has its counterparts. The counterpart to imposition of pressure would be Iran building more centrifuges. Is there a way around this so that, for example, someone suggested to me today, you know, that they'll, if, if the agreement is signed, there'll be some date certain in the future, you know, at which time the two parties will have had an opportunity to see what, what they, how they handle this. And at that time, perhaps, they could get to that and had a chance to <coughs> examine infection, um, <coughs> inspections and see if they were as everybody hoped they would be on the side of the P5 plus one, and you cooperated with that, that the AIEA had an opportunity uh, to, to do the kinds of things that they have insisted they be able to do. And it, by the November 15th or some date in the future certain, you would have a chance to evaluate whether the United States... Uh, was prepared and living by the terms of the deal, and they would have a chance, all the countries involved, to see if you had lived by the terms of the deal. Is that the way you're going to work out of this? Uh, not really. <laughs> we have, have had. You, have you thought about that idea? No. We have had plenty of time to see how we can we can do this. We will have hopefully an agreement by June 30th. If we have an agreement by June 30th, it would set a procedure in motion. That procedure will start with Iran taking some preparatory measures and the United States and EU taking some preparatory measures, all of them uh, endorsed beforehand by the Security Council in, in a resolution that will be binding on everybody, including the United States. The United States is a permanent member of the Security Council, but nevertheless, all decisions of the Security Council, whether Congress likes it or not, are binding upon the United States like any other member of the international community. So there will be a resolution of the Security Council. We'll set the terms of this agreement, and the two sides will start implementing this agreement simultaneously. We will take measures. The United States will take measures. It's not, it's not a trial and error period where you will test us and we will test you. We have had opportunity to test each other for the last many years. We have had the opportunity to test in an agreement that we signed in November 2013 for about 18 months. So now is the time to put in place very concrete measures. The concrete measures that Iran will put in place are very clear. 
we will reduce the number of our centrifuges for a period of time. We will reduce our stockpile of enriched uranium for a period of time. But we, what's the period of time? Th that's the period of time that we have discussed and negotiated, mostly 10 years. Right. And then the sanctions will be lifted. Not when, not after that period of time, at the beginning of that period of time. That's a very clear understanding. It's, it's not, not a clear understanding in terms of how Americans of significance... Well, they, and they don't say the that. People, they don't think you see, that you, you see, can if, eliminate Charlie, all if the sanctions have, at the beginning and then follow through. But you cannot have the cake and eat it too. You have to make a decision as we have to make a decision. The decision has to be whether you want to have an agreement or whether you want to continue the path of pressure and resistance on, on the part of Iran. Uh, the, these two are mutually exclusive. We can, in fact, we have a good deal. I believe we have the parameters of a good deal, which builds confidence, doesn't make anybody trust the other side. It will, I mean, we're not prepared to trust anybody at this And stage. the United States shouldn't either. No. We don't expect Neither it. Neither side should no, trust the no, other no, no. at this stage. Uh, obviously. Right? Obviously, we don't expect any side to, after such a long period of compounded mistrust, we need to have an opportunity to build that confidence. But it doesn't mean that I will take a part of the agreement that I'm supposed to implement hostage for that trust to be built. We will implement our part of the deal immediately. These will be basically nothing in this Tell world is totally do irreversible. What will you do immediately? The, we will agree to the set of parameters that Iran will have to implement immediately. The number of centrifuges, the amount of stock, the, uh, what will happen to our yeah. uh, heavy water reactor. And we have all agreed that this heavy water reactor will be redesigned. It will remain as a heavy water reactor, but it will not produce plutonium that would be capable of building a nuclear weapon. We never wanted this to, be, to build nuclear weapons. This is a medical isotope uh, research reactor. It will, it will do the same, uh, the same job. When you say you never wanted to build a nuclear weapon, even though the decision, everybody agrees, has not been made, uh, you do want the capacity, if you make a decision to build nuclear weapons, to be accessible as if you had nuclear weapons. You see, weapons. My, my, my problem, my friend, is that, that people in the United States see nuclear weapons as a panacea. Nuclear weapons have not brought anybody any security. We are more rational. We have a deep history. We've been, we've been around for, for millennia, yeah. for several millennia. So when we look uh, at history, history... that Americans respect. Uh, uh, and I think they should look at our history. In the past 250 years, we have not invaded any country. We are content with our size, with our population. But, but you have, I mean, you have invaded any country. Now, no, no country here comes to the, these kinds of conversations without having some involvement around the world of varying degrees. But you have, you know, people that you support are engaged in warfare in other countries. My Take, friend, who did we support? Hezbollah. Hezbollah, no, 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 my friend, Hezbollah is engaged no, in Syria, let, let, as you know. You, you cannot, you Iranians cannot are supporting you, you cannot uh, military start action in Yemen right my, my now. My friend, my friend. Am I wrong about that? Uh, you, you're wrong about where you start your history. Uh, can, can we say the United States supported the Taliban, the Saddam Hussein of Iraq? Yes. But, but, I mean, so uh, they, supported, they supported a lot of Saddam Hussein uh, in his war against Iran, uh, of which but, Iranians but, have not forgotten. We, and we will not forget. Exactly. We will not because forget. It was a brutal we will, war against we Iranians. We will certainly not forget the fact that our people, civilians, were targeted with chemical right. weapons, and nobody raised an eyebrow about it. Uh, this is this is this. These are parts of history that we will not forget. You shouldn't. And and we shouldn't forget. And the United States shouldn't forget the fact that it supported the wrong people in our part of the world and continues to support okay. we always we always resisted extremism in our region we resisted we're the only country that is standing up against this group of this bunch of terrorists which terrorists? daesh uh, uh islamic the, the so called group we just saw you're the only group that st stood against daesh who, who is who is doing it other than iran and Iraq, and the people of Syria. I, I, Unfortunately, may I, may I make a small suggestion there? Yes, yes, <laughs> please do. In Iraq, uh, when militia 
Iraqi militia supported by Iran, and Iran advises on the front line, according to an interview I did with the Iraqi prime minister last week. Sure. Iraq advises on the front line. Americans and people part of the coalition were engaged in airstrikes with the same objective, the well, retaking of Tikrit. Well, is that true or not? It's a bit late. Well, but is that, is that it, true? No, it, is it true? It, it's, it's a bit late. It's a bit too late. For four years, because of geopolitical considerations, unfortunately, in our region, mm -hmm. against Syria, against Iran, a group has developed, has been nourished, has been armed. A thousand people every month are infiltrating through some of our neighbors' borders into Iraq and Syria coming from 82 countries to join this very dangerous extremist group to kill the Syrian people. Essentially peoples. Sunni. Uh, well, it, it's not the issue of Sunni Shia. I know, but it's essentially it's the, Sunni. It's people. the issue, of, um, and they've killed more Sunnis. Do, can you remember the Jordanian pilot who was burned alive? Yes. Was he a Shia? He was a Sunni. Yes. Most victims of this group are Sunni. Well, that was Muslim. because he'd been a pilot. Too, no, no. And, and, most and victims... This is not a sectarian issue. This it isn't is, part this, of sectarian no, 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 issue. No, no. Is it not people, at all? People, there is no. Are you saying to me, you know, that people want to no, give it? People want to give it. I'm not. No, no. People want to give it a sectarian flavor, Charlie. And it's very, very dangerous if you give this a sectarian flavor. Maybe some people will see very short-sighted benefits in giving that a sectarian flavor. But you've got to be clear. You've got to be clear that this is an enemy of everybody. Okay. Daesh is an enemy of I, Saudi Arabia as much as it is an enemy of Iran and, and should Iraq. the United States and Iran be working together uh, to defeat Daesh? But we are certainly... That's an easy question. Uh, we are certainly working to defeat Daesh to the extent that the governments in the region, Iraq and Syria, ask us to be involved. We believe that this is a regional issue and a global issue. It is a regional issue first right. and a global issue Shh. later. There should be international cooperation. It's not United Shh. States and Iran. It, the, the, the world is not composed of right. only United States and Iran. A lot of other countries, a lot of other countries in the region. We, we are engaged in, in, this, uh, in this fight in, in a very serious way. And we believe that everybody needs to be engaged against and Including us. the United States. But and if, this if happens the United to be a case, the threat of ISIL, Daesh, is a very high priority threat on the part of the United States. Well, uh, I'm, I'm happy to see that it and is you know becoming one. Yeah. I'm, I'm happy to see that it's becoming but one. It's but but before, before it invaded... The, it, before okay. before it, it, it started its operation against Iraq, it wasn't the case because people were yeah. tolerating it when it was attacking the Syrian government. That's unfortunate. But you've got to remember, I mean, history started some time ago. It didn't start today. It didn't start well, with, with Daesh moving into Iraq and, okay, and occupying okay. Mosul. This is where we end part one of our two-part conversation with Iran's foreign minister, Javad Zarif. Thank you for joining us. See you next time.